Okay, so we're going to read chapter 4, um, The Green Stucco House, on page 23. And last time we read, um, Cecile had just gotten them on the bus, and they had lied about Delphine's age, and they were all kind of nervous to see where Cecile lived. And um, So now we get to see The Green Stucco House, page 23. Big Ma said Cecile lived on the street. The park bench was her bed. She lived in a hole in the wall. You can't say stuff like that to a kid asking about her mother when it's snowing outside or pouring down raining. You can't say, your mother lives on the street in a hole in the wall sleeping on park benches next to winos. I didn't understand expressions when I was six, that they were strings of words spoken so often the string fell slack. Your mother lives on the street in a hole in the wall sleeping on park benches next to winos. Sounded exactly as Big Ma said it. When you're six, you picture your mother living on black and gray tar full of potholes, broken glass, skid marks, and blackened gum. All of that overrun by cars, buses, and trucks. You squeeze your brain one way, your imagination the other way, and see your mother peeking out the holes of crumbling abandoned buildings to stay dry when it snowed or rained. You see your mother sleeping on splintery park benches stained with pigeon poop and a smelly toothless wino sleeping next to her. When you're six, you wonder why your mother would rather live on the street in a hole in the wall and sleep on park benches next to winos than live with you. Even though I'd finally figured out these were expressions and not the plain factual truth, I expected Cecile Johnson to, at the very least, be bad off to be one of those Negroes living in poverty, as the news often put it. I expected I'd have to nudge Vanetta and Fern into knowing better when they asked for all the things we had at home, like Mr. Bubble Bubble Bath, extra helpings of chicken and ham, or banana pudding on Sundays. When Cecile slowed her man-sized steps, tore off her big hat, her scarf, and her dark glasses, we knew we had arrived. We followed her into the yard and down the walkway. I stared at her eight thick braids of unpressed hair, pencils shoved in the plate above her ear. Then I joined my sisters, taken in the shock of her house and yard, the place where she lived. This is your house? Vanetta was the first to put our amazement into words. To begin with, the house was covered in peaks of hard green frosting. Stucco, Cecile called it. She said she applied the stucco herself. The green prickly house was surrounded by a dried-out but neatly trimmed lawn. To one side of the house was a rectangular concrete slab with a roof over it. A carport, she said. Just no car. On the other side, a baby palm tree sloped toward the sun. That palm tree was as out of place as the stucco. That's how I could be sure it was Cecile's home, all right. Even though Cecile said the house was hers and not to worry about how she got it, that wasn't enough to suit Vanetta. Big Ma said... I kicked her before she could go further. She knew better than to repeat Big Ma's words, and if she didn't, that kick should have smarted her into knowing better. Whether Cecile heard Vanetta starting to insult her or if she saw me kick her second child, she didn't let on. She just said, come on, and put the key in the door. We walked inside and looked around. I expected to see writing on the walls, wavy-colored hippie writing all over, since she was free to do what she wanted in her own house. I expected to read strings and strings of words tapped out from her pencil onto the walls. But the walls in Cecile's house were clean, painted a yellow beige, and had no writing. Still, flashes of memory popped before me. Flashes of Cecile writing on the walls and on boxes. Flashes of paint smells. Papa painting over her pencil marks. Flashes of loud. Papa and Cecile. Angry talking. When I'd asked about it, Uncle Darnell said they had fought over Cecile writing on the walls all the time. Your room's in the back. Bathroom across the hall. The day bed rolls out. That should be enough for all y'all. Fern folded her arms, holding Miss Patty Cake by a tuft of her patchy yellow hair. We need night beds. We sleep at night. <laughs> I could tell Cecile didn't know whether to be annoyed or amused. She looked at all of us, wondering not only who we were, but what we were. Fern didn't notice the scrutiny. She turned to me. I don't nap in the daytime. I'm in the second grade. Never to be outdone, Vanetta said, I'm in the fourth grade. Cecile said, I didn't ask for all that. 
As I expected, Vanetta's feelings got hurt, because she was always sticking herself on stage for everyone to see her. Still, Vanetta hadn't been kicked enough. She whirled around in the living room like a dance recital fairy, whirled around on her heels, taking in the clean walls and curtains, a beat-up sofa, a few stacks of books, and not much else, landed and said, "'Where's the TV and everything?' Vanetta was too far from me to nudge or kick. Cecile dropped Fern's bag on the floor and started muttering, I didn't send for you. Didn't want you in the first place. Should have gone to Mexico to get rid of you when I had the chance. It didn't seem like she was talking to us. She didn't even look at Vanetta or Fern and me. She kept talking, muttering about Mexico, throwing her Matahara disguise on the beat-up sofa. Our mother wore pencils in her hair, dressed like a secret agent, had a sticky, stickly, prickly house, a palm tree when no one else had one, and clean painted walls instead of the writing I remembered. Now I got why our mother ran away. Our mother was crazy. Come on, I said, let's see the room. Put our stuff away. Vanetta and Fern raced down the hall, pushing to be first. Cecile yelled after them, but they were too excited to hear her. I came in after them, a bed with a brass headboard and arm rails, a blue cover, a dresser, a goose-necked floor lamp with a glass bowl in the shape of a half moon. It was more furniture than she had in the living room. We can't all fit in this one bed, Vanetta said. I raised up the blue cover and found the other bed underneath. Underneath, Come on, help me pull it out. We all latched on and pulled. The bed rolled out into a stair step of one bed below and another above. I said she should have helped us. Surely should have, Fern said. I sleep on top, Vanetta called. No, I sleep on top. Fern did her best Rocky the Flying Squirrel leap, arms outstretched to belly on the bed, onto the bed. Vanetta followed, and they wrapped into wrestling. I let them. They hadn't had a good fight all day. After six and a half hours on the plane and keeping up with Cecile, I figured they could use the recreation. They took turns getting the best of each other. But just before crying time set in, I pulled one off the other and said, You both sleep on top. There's enough room. Why do you get a bed all to yourself, Vanetta cried. You're not that big that you need a bed all to yourself. I was big enough to give up a full view of the world on the 727, and big enough to outsmart my sisters at every turn. You can come down here with me, I said, scooting over so I wasn't claiming the whole bed. I don't care. I'm staying on top, Vanetta said. Me too. We looked around in silence at the walls, the dresser, the goose-necked floor lamp with its half-moon glass bowl. It certainly wasn't much. Vanetta wanted to say something. She had that look. "'Spit it out, Vanetta,' I said. "'Yeah, spit it out,' Fern said. Vanetta cut her eyes toward Fern. "'To me,' she said, Delphine. "'What we got to do with Mexico?' "'That one had also thrown me when Cecile said it. "'Should have gone to Mexico to get rid of you when I had the chance. "'I didn't rightfully know what that meant, "'but was all my sisters had, so I said, "'That's where women go who don't want their babies. "'But why Mexico? "'And not Queens,' Fern asked.' "'Cause Queens is too close,' I said, as if I knew. "'Then I added, showing all of my age and wisdom. "'They buy babies down in Mexico for rich people.' "'They both said, "'Oh, I didn't want to say Big Ma was right. "'Cecile was no kind of mother. "'Cecile didn't want us. "'Cecile was crazy. "'I didn't have to. "'Now I really don't like Cecile. "'I kind of want to smack her in the face a little bit. "'But... <laughs> Um, I'll try to get you the next chapter just as soon as I can.